today we are really thankful to Mike uh, from Arcview, Mike Van Dark, and he will be uh, presenting on using augmented reality to strengthen asset management and HNS for field crews. So without any further ado, I would like to uh, pass on to Mike, and after his presentation, we will have uh, a five to ten minutes of questions and answers with Mike. So all the attendees, you would have a questions section box on your panel, so you can write your questions, and hopefully at the end of the uh, webinar and the presentation, uh, Mike will go through the questions and answer as much as possible. Uh, once again, thank you for joining, and uh, Mike, uh, all to you. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Uh, I hope you can all see the screen. Uh, what I'm going to do is start with is a very brief uh, introductory video, one minute long, just to give you a brief feel for uh, what Augview and augmented reality looks like currently on, on tablets and smartphones. So bear with me while I just start this video. Thanks for bearing with me there on the little video. It just gives us a brief feel for some of the uh, uses that we can currently start to uh, have for augmented reality on, on sort of tablets and smartphones. Well, today we're already going to look at um, uh, uh, augmented reality for utilities and telcos um, and uh, potentially councils uh, for managing uh, primarily underground assets and in particular um, looking at the um, advantages of using augmented reality with regard to health and safety and um, uh, collateral damage type events. So I'm going to start it with a little introduction and background and uh, what we see as the problem that we're trying to solve uh, using augmented reality. Um, I'm going to talk about what augmented reality is and in particular two aspects to augmented reality. First, uh, AR for uh, we say geospatial AR where we use the GPS to position ourselves and secondly uh, image recognition AR, where we actually recognize features from the video stream. I'll talk about each of those and how they may be able to be used in, uh, in concert uh, to enable some new capabilities. We'll look at the um, sort of key features that might be put together into a product such as Augview and what the proposition is, uh, what the benefits are and the, uh, the actual value proposition and where all this is going because obviously today we're talking about tablets and smartphones but where is this going into the future? I think you might be interested in that. If you have any questions um, feel free to write them all down and, and, and um, I, I can't currently see your questions but hopefully we'll get some, uh, some time at the end to, uh, to answer those questions and we'll be able to, uh, to see them at that stage. Um, as you can see, I've been in the GIS industry for a very long time. I'm sure some of you um, may, may have, uh, we, may, we may have met in the past in one of my past lives, uh, either with Small World or TerraLink or, or earlier. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've got a long history in GIS and um, really since 2012 I've been focusing on uh, OrgView, uh, the development of augmented reality capability for mobile environments. Um, the background for utilities and telcos and, and some councils is that these uh, really have been quite heavily restructured in the last 30 to 40 years, certainly from the time where I started in the GIS industry. Uh, the, each of the power companies, water authorities, telcos were 
monopolies. They were primarily government-owned or government-owned um, uh, enterprises or total monopolies. Um, they had long-term employees. Uh, you know, you worked for the company for 30 years. You worked in anything from the design department, drafting department, uh, construction, and then maintenance. You knew in your head where the network was. You knew how it was connected. You'd put it there. You'd maintained it over years. You knew your patch. Um, that's no longer the case. These industries have been um, corporatized, privatized, restructured heavily. Uh, large monopolies have been broken up, um, same way that, for instance, Telstra in Australia has been restructured, same here in New Zealand with Telecom New Zealand. Um, these, these organizations get broken down into more, into more uh, or less monopolistic structures, uh, and the, now the delivery of the service is often separated from the design of, and build of the asset and the ownership of the assets over which those services are provided. Um, the result of a lot of this is that now the asset owners own the assets, but almost all of the uh, work done designing, building, maintaining those assets is subcontracted out by a deep hierarchy of contractors. Some of those contractors have very specialized jobs. To compete, they need to actually employ low-cost employees and be very uh, efficient um, and our, at, at their particular part of the whole whole business. Um, in order to get low-cost employees, often they are poorly educated, poorly trained, uh, but often young. So the old guys like myself uh, have either retired or uh, perhaps managing one part of some of these subcontracting organizations, but largely a lot of their knowledge has been lost from the industry. At the same time, networks have got more congested. Certainly under the ground, it's got a lot more congested. People have started putting in different types of networks. It started out moving from co regular copper, con uh, copper networks to uh, cable TV networks to fiber networks in the telecommunications environments. We've seen um, multiple competing electricity companies in some areas, multiple competing gas supply, uh, gas network suppliers in some areas. So what's under the ground has got more and more congested. Uh, sometimes uh, equipment is left abandoned under the ground and uh, we have to work around that and know which is live, which is actually abandoned. Um, that density leads to collateral damage during maintenance or new builds uh, often. There are significant risks, health and safety in particular. Uh, people working in the areas of high pressure gas or high voltage, um, there are some significant health and safety issues. And now there is, in this privatized industry of ours and with litigation becoming more prominent, uh, then liabilities are being escalated. And a lot of the time now, it is the directors of the companies that initiated or requested the work who have the ultimate liability. And so directors' liabilities are becoming very prominent. So insurance companies, uh, <laughs> are very well aware now that they're providing cover uh, at direct level for any liabilities to damage to networks. Whilst in New Zealand we're a non-litigious society and we have uh, or, uh, structures such as accident corporation, accident, sorry, compensation corporation to reduce the risks of uh, litigation and liability uh, going through, through the courts, uh, in other parts of, of the world that isn't the case. And so litigation is a very normal activity, uh, often uh, following network, network damage, especially with outages. So what's the problem? The problem is typically where the heck are all those assets? Where are they? Uh, where were they buried? Where are they in relation to each other? Where are they in relation to me or my, or my, or my tools? Um, what are their characteristics? Are they dangerous or are they, are they live? Um, how deep are they? How large are they? How well insulated or protected are they? Are they protected by any um, uh, tape or RFID or other mechanism to help identify where it is? Other information such as other, other uh, activities such as trying to determine when to install, when to replace, when to upgrade and so on, uh, that's going to be dependent um, quite largely on where it is and where it is in relation to other assets. We've mentioned liability and health and safety. A lot of this comes down to either data or what I might call 
operator awareness. So with regards to data, it's completeness, accuracy, and timeliness. You know, is the data up to date? Is it complete? How accurate is it? How confident can I be in the information that is provided? And then even if I'm provided with that information, am I really aware of how it all relates to each other and relates to the, to the ground that I can see and relates to my position? Well, what happens when it goes wrong? Well, there are many, many occurrences of actually when it goes wrong. Not all of them, uh, in fact, the vast majority do not get in the papers and don't get on TV. Some of them uh, do because they cause outages or they cause road closures or evacuations. So last year, very interestingly, just before I gave a presentation to the Gas Association in New Zealand um, on the use of augmented reality, uh, exactly the same as I'm doing to you today, really, um, there was a major outage in Christchurch. And so the first thing we knew, the police issued a press release saying it was a gas leak and the public can expect diversions. Uh, in actual fact, um, it took a few hours to clear, but it was a major gas leak. Fortunately, it did not catch fire. What happened was the operator of a digger took the top off a, um, a T-junction. I think it was a T. Um, the T-junction is structured so that um, the fitting uh, goes up above the surface of the main and then and then goes in a right angle um, uh, out parallel with the surface. The digger operator had been exposing that main very carefully, good operator, um, but he was unaware of the existence or the exact location of that T and knocked the top off the whole thing. It's a high pressure gas main. Uh, the gas did not catch fire, but it prompted major, major outage and a major uh, evacuation of the area. So all of the uh, road area and the immediate proximity was uh, blocked off, the trains were stopped, evacuations took place around about three and a half thousand people. As I mentioned, we're not an, uh, a litigious society in New Zealand, so there's probably no litigation at all. Um, but what was the economic impact and what was the potential health and safety impact if that had actually burst into flames? In New Zealand, this sort of damage is done very regularly and in actual fact I'm sure it is in Australia and around the rest of the world. If I look at the gas network here in Auckland, um, then Vector is the local distributor uh, for the gas network and they have to report certain types of events to the Commerce Commission, the government here, uh, on an annual basis. They had eight notifiable damage events every week for the entire year. So 423 uh, unplanned interruptions were caused by third-party damage uh, that, in, in that particular year of 2013. So that's, um, and those numbers there, 57 events per thousand kilometres of network, so on. Sometimes they catch fire, and when they do, if somebody notices it and takes footage or takes photograph, it becomes uh, a major issue because then the public gets to see it, it's very spectacular. In May last year, there was a very spectacular one in Sydney and somebody caught this on video and it went onto the press and went onto the news and the guy actually was severely burnt. So it was a major issue, uh, collateral damage again. So what's the cause? What are the, what's the cause of a lot of this damage? Um, you know, you can say, well, was the operator actually aware of the appropriate procedures? These procedures are very well documented. I'm really impressed by the level of documentation and how readable it is and how well widespread uh, is its dis uh, dissemination. Um, so, in general, I'd say most of the operators would definitely be aware of the appropriate procedures. Um, did they follow the procedures? Well, there's a question yeah, that's often asked, were all of the procedures followed? Um, in the case of Christchurch, I think everybody agreed that the pre procedures had been followed, but um, perhaps the data wasn't complete. Uh, so were they provided with all the information? Well, that's a good question. Sometimes the information is either out of date and not accurate, um, or not complete, so it's just completely missing information. Then did the operator actually comprehend the information that's provided? Now, in the case of normal procedure with the sort of the uh, before you dig type approach that is predominantly uh, uh, in use here in Australia and New Zealand, and in fact quite widespread uh, similar sort of systems around the world, then people are provided with a stack of PDFs or physical printed documents uh, from each of the asset owners. Uh, these are often at different scales, sometimes different orientations uh, with quite different 
sets of symbology and the operator needs to be able to understand the multiple layers of information and somehow put it together into his head into a consistent um, comprehensible model inside his head. That's actually quite a difficult task, um, especially when the uh, representations are very varied and sometimes the scales and orientations are different. Then that last thing is spatial awareness. Does the operator actually understand exactly where he is placed and where his equipment is placed in relation to all those underground assets? And that can be very difficult. So it comes down to information, comprehension of the information, and then spatial awareness. So how can we overcome or how can we resolve some of the difficulties in these areas? Well, we believe that we can do that using an augmented reality approach to uh, augment what we see with additional information in a meaningful 3D way. So what is augmented reality about? It provides a live view of the physical real, or real world environment, then we add to that using computer generated um, input or outputs. Uh, it could be overlays, in this case overlays of the 3D model over the video display. It's a bit of a sliding scale. Everything from what we see today, which is reality, through to fully enclosed systems such as those provided by uh, headsets such as the Oculus Rift, they provide a totally virtual environment and a virtual model in an enclosed space, so you don't get to see any of reality in that environment. So augmented reality is a, a continuum between those two extremes. Uh, there are many different ways of actually stimulating augmented reality. Uh, one of the earliest ways that you'll probably be very familiar with is uh, marker and image recognition. So with marker recognition, we actually recognize some sort of image or we recognize some sort of, um, uh, that could be a QR code initially or, or equivalent, it could be barcodes um, or it could be particular features within an image. Uh, you'll probably be familiar with Nintendo 3DS, a uh, little gaming station, um, and then subsequent um, implementations of similar sort of gaming uh, you know, games implemented on both uh, iOS and Android, and uh, more recently Windows 8. Um, Boeing was one of the first uh, major industrial um, operators to uh, use augmented reality uh, in particular for image recognition, um, or utilizing image recognition. And they used it to identify pieces of um, equipment inside wing structures and engine, engine bays. And that's, that was quite some time ago, I think around about eight years ago. Um, we talk about two forms, geospatial augmented reality and image recognition. Well, image recognition, obviously we recognize something in the video stream. With geospatial, we actually recognize where we are using the GPS or GNSS sensor and the other sensors in the device. And using that, we can overlay the virtual model. So in this example, I see data uh, coming from multiple different data sources overlaid over the video stream. Uh, so in this case, it looks like it's a uh, communications or power network um, plus water supply network, drainage and stormwater. The representations can be quite varied. Sometimes we want to represent sort of trench structures. Uh, other times just simply uh, pipes and cables and ducts and conduits under the ground. So um, sometimes the trench structure type uh, approach actually uh, it makes it more um, comprehensible. We don't, it, it, it's less likely to look like it's floating above the ground. Uh, once you're moving, if you're holding a handset and actually moving, you actually really do get a sense of the trench sitting down into the surface of the, uh, the footpath in this case. So what are the sensors that we require? Well, the, we need a camera obviously to, to uh, provide the video feed and then we need the sensor, the GNSS sensor to locate ourselves, so where am I? The magnetometer to say uh, which direction am I facing? An accelerometer or inclinometer or G-meter as sometimes known which tells us about where gravity is and, where the, and hence where the horizon is. And the gyroscope tells us largely how we're moving in a rotational sense, um, sometimes in terms of uh, linear acceleration, but more often in terms of uh, rotational acceleration. We can put these two things together, these two types of augmented reality, the geospatial augmented reality that knows where we are and where we're looking, and the image recognition um, AR, 
we put the two together. So as we're walking down the street, we might be looking through the video. It knows where we're looking and where we are. And when we look at the scene, it may suddenly recognize something that we've programmed the application to recognize. In this case, a simple little pedestal. And it's a telecommunications pedestal. And it might say, yes, I recognize that. And when I recognize it, I can then pop up a configurable set of options. Uh, in this case, I recognize the feature, and then I can present some options about what I want to do next. In this case, maybe I want to uh, look at the object's attributes or confirm whether that particular one is in the same location, uh, or do I need to update its location, or it might decide there is no such device as this in the close proximity, and therefore maybe do I want to capture a new one. If I do recognize it, and also there is such a device in close proximity to where I'm located, then I might want to view its history or view its customers that are connected and so on. So I can have a configurable list of functions that are um, uh, stimulated once I recognize um, a, a particular device. In this case, I'm just showing some attributes. This can also be used in isolation. So uh, for indoor plant, I could actually um, just utilize the uh, image recognition AR function. Uh, and it might just provide a simple, so I, I recognize it. It might highlight the border of the thing it recognizes. Uh, once it's recognized, it'll pop up that configurable list of um, tasks or options, sorry, uh, one of which might be the task list. If I clicked on the task list, it might give me that list of tasks for this particular feature. And it might tell me I need to replace the card in slot four and highlight it for me and then connect port one and then run the appropriate tests if I have access to that sort of functionality. So again, this is augmented reality. Uh, it can display and highlight and stimulate functions uh, it could just uh, generate a, a could link straight through to a video in, indicating how I should connect the device, or it could link through to a 3D model, which might explode out and show me how the, the, the feature is uh, assembled or built. So basically, the list of functions I can trigger is a totally configurable uh, set. Now, some, if we're using geospatial AR, then the accuracy of the GPS is critical. Um, traditional or our standard consumer grade devices, the uh, tablets and smartphones, do not have high accuracy GPS units built in. There is no ability to have differential GPS or RTK corrections uh, currently with the uh, consumer grade devices. That, that may come in time, but currently it's not available. Um, so if I stand still, over a uh, survey mark. In this case, I'm using a 2012 model Samsung Note. This is neither bad nor nor good. It's just a run-of-the-mill machine. Um, then, the uh, even though the uh, tablet is stationary over a survey mark, um, the received calculated GPS position is drifting all over the place. The blue line represents the drift. You notice it's drifting up to five meters away from the real location. This device was not moving at all. It was totally stationary above that survey mark. The red dotted line is actually the mean position. Uh, the mean position quite quickly moved in very close to uh, the actual true location. That survey mark was probably within um, uh, three to five centimeters of ground truth. I think it was a level two survey mark. Um, there are circles there show the first and second standard deviation of error from the mean. So here we're using statistical techniques to improve the, the positional accuracy of an instantaneous sort of uh, a GPS um, value that a tablet might give you. So if I can sample, this just shows an example that if I can sample over a short period of time in an environment where I don't have a large amount of multipath, then in actual fact an ordinary bog standard consumer grade device can give me pretty reasonable uh, accuracy, in this case, to within 0.7 of a meter. We also actually calculate on the fly a third value, which is the 95% confidence interval. Um, so the confident, that 95% confidence interval gives me um, a sort of X and Y ranges um, that if I sample often enough, that confidence interval should come down to some sensible value. And we can typically achieve confidence interval in the range of about 0.7 of a meter using these sort of consumer grade devices. Uh, it does vary quite a lot from device to device. 
and so I strongly recommend um, some extensive testing uh, in your environment before you, um, you know, select a large number of, of, of particular type of devices. Um, the, in order to get better, better quality positioning, which we really need for an AR environment, clearly if I'm walking down the road and I'm just using the instantaneous position that's being fed to me from my consumer grade device, then I could be drifting all over the place. And that drift is in the order of 0.2 or 0.25 of a metre per second, typically. It is a drift, you'll notice. Uh, that actual sequence that we see saw run there, was that was a 24 minute sequence that I sped up. Um, so there was uh, quite a large number of sample points there. Um, but within 45 seconds, it had stabilised very good, very very well close to within 0.7 of a metre of, of uh, ground truth. Um, but if I'm walking down the street taking an instantaneous value, then I'm going to be drifting all over the place. So for dynamic situations where we're moving, the consumer grade devices do not have sufficient accuracy uh, just from their, their, their own positioning to really give me really good um, location for augmented reality. At the moment, I still need to augment that. I still need to add um, capability to do either differential GPS corrections or RTK. Now, two years ago, um, such devices that I could link into my tablet, uh, perhaps using Bluetooth, they were in the range of twelve to twenty-five thousand um, dollars. About eighteen months ago, I discovered the first one of those. Um, that I personally discovered it was about six and a half thousand US dollars. Um, and that was the first lower cost device I came across, and now that price has plummeted in the last few months. Um, we've been playing with a device called a Neo, which we can actually get into New Zealand here in the order of a thousand New Zealand dollars. Uh, it's differential GPS and RTK uh, capable, and it's giving us you know, better than a meter and down to um, sort of about 0.5 of a meter. Uh, sometimes better than that with a good view of the sky. The separate antenna uh, and um, uh, separate little battery and comms pack, um, and that communicates to the tablet via RTK, no, via sort of Bluetooth. Um, that's an example. Uh, more recently, um, the Trimble R1 is a new unit from Trimble. Um, it's also, I, th I believe, you'll have to confirm the pricing. I believe it's in the range of two and a half to three and a half thousand dollars, but. Uh, don't quote me on that. Please talk to your Trimble guys. Um, but now there are other competing devices as well um, that you'll see coming out from, I expect, Leica. Uh, EOS was another one that we just came across recently and so on. So the, uh, these high accuracy devices designed to link in to tablets and phones to give good accuracy have come down way, way down in price and becoming making the whole, uh, whole approach much more viable. And we'll continue to see that improving over the next few years as well. Uh, note that the, um, this particular device, the R1, is designed to go in your pocket and it needs to be facing up that way. The antenna is at the top. Um, antenna position is critical also on tablets and smartphones, so when you're doing your testing, if you are testing, make sure you try the device in different orientations. It does make a difference. So how does this, this all work? Well, Ordinary 2D mobile GIS functionality just asks typically uh, web servers for maps. So we use map services and we overlay the multiple maps to put together a composite map, uh, maybe a background and then multiple overlays on that of, different, of the different utilities. But when we create the augmented reality view, what we do is instead of asking for maps, we ask for the features. So we use feature services typically and ask for the features in the area and then we assemble and generate the 3D model of the network dynamically within the mobile device. We don't pre-process any of that uh, at the web servers. These are the state is typically coming from two-dimensional GIS databases, but we use information such as diameter and height and depth and so on to help structure the 3D model. So we use the 2D alignments plus information like depth or height and so on to generate the 3D model. Um, so we generate the 3D model for the local area, maybe several hundred meters uh, in, in our proximity, and if we walk towards the edge of that area, then we, we uh, ask the web servers for a bit more data and extend that model. 
Security is a big deal. Um, most of our, um, I'm sure all of you actually, are very comfortable using internet banking. Well, exactly so are the companies that we deal with, such as our utilities and calcos. That's how they get paid. That's how they do transactions also. So they're interested, they, they're comfortable with internet banking. Well, I believe we've created an environment that is more secure than internet banking. But somehow still we often are needing to, uh, to convince and educate um, the IT departments within these organizations. Um, first thing we do is we make sure that uh, all devices have to be registered to, in order to use the application and access the data. Um, the devices have to be registered, so device registration is, is required. Obviously user registration, username and password in the standard way that you would expect in any internet banking type application. So that gives us the access through to our particular environment. Um, SSL, we insist that our customers use SSL or HTTPS, um, although you know some, some um, public environments are still publishing things uh, un, unencrypted um, with open HTTP. Um, the Malaysian government asked uh, if we would implement a full audit trail. Uh, they wanted to be able to monitor all requests um, being made on these environments uh, and from this application uh, so that they could monitor if they wanted to um, even just uh, map requests to, just to look at where people are asking for information. Uh, so full audit trail is optional uh, and also spatial access control is also optional. And this was a request um, coming out of the US. Um, they didn't want people stealing a tablet with the software installed on it. Uh, and stealing a uh, username and password and being able to access the data, for instance, for one of the New York networks, um, but from Tehran, perhaps, or some other foreign country. Um, I can understand that, that request. So how do we do all that? Well, largely the um, quick over architectural overview. Basically, the only thing that OrgView hosts is the what we call the OrgView registration server which has the information about device registrations, user registrations, and project definitions. Um, the project definitions really just uh, are effectively define what, what set of URLs to go and get data from uh, for a particular project, and how the elements that we request to be displayed within the augmented reality view um, should be displayed. So how do we stylize and symbolize the elements in the augmented reality display. So there's not much data stored within the OrgView environment. It's all coming from your web servers and third-party web servers, such as Google or the Council or other utilities or Bing or OpenStreetMaps and so on. Or here maps. We just had an interesting inquiry from here maps the other day as well. Um, so what's the user value proposition? Well, um, by being able to actually have all the data at your fingertips in the field. In a, fully, in a really easily comprehensible way, uh, it really does increase operator efficiency. Uh, so we see that that operator efficiency is just uh, gained through uh, ease of comprehension. Uh, the ability to actually see multiple data sources overlaid simultaneously uh, over each other. Um, the ability to do live updates directly from the field back to a, um, a, a, a GIS web server uh, if you're authorized to do that. Um, usually the guy in the field is the expert. Normally he has to record it in some form, field book or a digital field book, and then somebody else transcribes that through into the final database. Uh, that's a back office function, and it's usually full of errors. Uh, they're usually not the experts, and also causes all sorts of transcription errors. And there's usually also a timing issue. Some, we saw some of the uh, councils with a three-year backlog of such updates uh, not so long ago. Um, so there's a reduction in back office processes, increased efficiency, and all that stuff just leads to reduced costs. Um, the fact that uh, the 3D models uh, really present the information in a way that's very understandable to young, a young workforce, um, because it's a three, 3D is really the environments that they tend to play in at home on, on the computer, and they, they play in uh, on their tablets and smartphones. Um, the young workforce also is typically not trained in the geoschematic representations that we see historically uh, in the uh, telco and, and power companies uh, in particular. Um, 
we also think it actually assists with uh, just just the whole thing about spatial awareness and the relationship between where assets are and where the user is. The fact that the data is uh, directly updated from the field improves data timeliness uh, and data quality. And so overall, we think there is significant reduction in, in, uh, in, in risk, uh, health and safety risk, uh, collateral damage risk, litigation risk, as well as well as just the efficiency gains. This can be put down into numbers. We can convert these some of these things directly into numbers. And this particular it was a little this particular um, spreadsheet shows an example of a little study we did, trying to look at the actual costs and uh, what the efficiency gains were. And we were thinking we were um, looking at potentially each implementation uh, of uh, one license on one device saves in the order of tw at least twenty thousand dollars per annum just through to improvements in efficiency, improvements in, in data through the infield data update process, and through risk reduction due to health and safety uh, cost reductions and network damage. Uh, collateral damage uh, cost reductions as well. So today we're using uh, tablets and smartphones, but I'm sure we're all aware that if we go out in the middle of the day in bright sunlight, using such devices is very difficult. We get a lot of reflection. Um, uh, the screen brightness is an issue. So where is it all going? Well, it's going towards augmented reality glasses. But uh, with augmented reality glasses, we're throwing away our user interface. We're going to um, we don't have a tablet or a, a, a pad to, to um, actually uh, tap at or select menu items from. So the sensor in the center of the screen and the center of the glasses there actually is a sensor that detects finger and hand motion. And so with that sensor, we can actually then manipulate a holographic or virtual uh, user interface that appears to float in three dimensions in front of our face. Um, those glasses were uh, um, state of the art two years ago, believe it or not. They were presented at a um, uh, conference in California just a little over two years ago, and that was the state of the art at the time. Well, in two years, it's come a long way. So now you'll see there are multiple augmented reality uh, manufacturers and vendors around the, around the world. Um, 18 months ago, we invested in a, uh, one of the startups, a company called Meta. And so we've got uh, two sets of their glasses here in the office. These glasses, as far as I can see at the moment, um, and I haven't seen any different uh, yet, uh, are not really uh, for production use um, yet uh, in real world situations. Glasses such as the uh, Google Glass are not really viable in our environments. And uh, I, I believe they look like they're a dead end technology. And I think that's been confirmed by Google's recent um, uh, recent uh, change of heart with, with glass. Um, but what we'll see is glasses like the Meta Pro being released this year. Um, and uh, again, they are full AR glasses. They do have a little cable that um, connects to a, uh, uh, a little pack that includes 3G, 4G, uh, and battery pack, and, um, and GPS, and so on, um, or, and Bluetooth. Uh, and so that'll either sit on your shoulder on a shoulder pad or um, sit on your hip or in a top pocket or something. Um, and these glasses will actually be fully usable, although not necessarily in bright outdoor conditions still. Two bits of technology that are really still in development in the AR glasses world are um, the, the projector systems to give very high resolution displays. And secondly, the, uh, the finger and um, hand motion detection mechanisms, because a lot of the techniques currently are subject to um, being flooded in outdoor environments by, um, by infrared, uh, they use infrared depth sensors, and so that technology really has limited use outdoors. Um, so the key features of our solution, uh, as you can see, are mobile GIS, heterogeneous web servers, um, so pick up data largely from just about anywhere you can get it. It's platform agnostic, so Android, iOS, and uh, we're just about to release Windows 8.1. Uh, online and offline support, um, the full range of view analysis, update and capture, high security, uh, two forms of augmented reality image recognition, geospatial, very fast to configure and, and uh, deploy, and low cost of acquisition. So we've been very fortunate um, in um, uh, winning some awards recently uh, for this technology, and we're now starting to gain customers around the world. 
um, but I think this is really a, a, a staging post. I think we'll see mass adoption of this type of technology when augmented reality glasses uh, become consumer grade devices and my prediction is that we're looking at around about 2020, between 2018 and 2020 for, um, for uh, mass adoption of AR glasses and that'll see effectively the demise of tablets I think. Uh, tablets will go the way of the uh, DAT tape, the CD drive uh, and so on as, um, as uh, relics of history quite quickly. So on that note, uh, just thank you again for the opportunity to present. I hope it's been interesting and um, feel free to pop up some questions and can I hand control back now to our, uh, our JITA representative. Thank you very much Mike, uh, that was a really interesting uh, presentation, I really enjoyed it and I believe uh, the audience have really enjoyed uh, uh, really useful information. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions. Uh, you can probably see them from your questions dialog box as well. So it's questions from Ben. Uh, uh, two questions. One is that uh, can you give us the link to that device? I believe the device was the more accurate GPS's tumblers, I think. And the other question yeah, is. Yeah, sure. There's actually. Uh, yeah. uh, what customers do you have in Melbourne so far? Okay, I don't believe we have any customers yet in Melbourne. Um, we are talking with a number of prospects in Victoria, um, but I probably shouldn't name them at this point in time. Um, but we are talking to multiple prospects uh, at the moment in, in Victoria and throughout Australia. Um, I've just recently been um, through uh, parts of China, uh, Hong Kong and uh, Middle East, um, and we have some uh, our first Chinese customer. We have a customer in Malaysia, um, other um, customers in New South Wales, I believe, um, and uh, so on. Now, the uh, um, new uh, low-cost GPS devices, uh, please talk to Trimble or your local Trimble um, distributor for the Trimble R1. Uh, you'll see that also on the Trimble website. Um, the other one I was, uh, if you look up EOS, E-O-S, uh, I'm not quite sure. You'll, if you look up EOS um, GPS, you'll quickly come across that device. Um, we've been the distributor here uh, for the NEO recently. Uh, we've been getting them assembled in Germany, um, and uh, so we can supply those units. Um, let's have a look what else we've got here in our questions. See if I can expand the questions here. Yes, thank you for those. Yeah, Warren uh, has another question. Is there a development kit for integrating with the GIS database systems and applications? Um, no, basically um, we have a configuration environment. Uh, the configuration environment lets the, um, the customer configure what we call a project. And so a project is a set of URLs. Oh, this configuration is all done online uh, on our one of our um, uh, via an HTML uh, web interface. Um, that configuration allows the user to select uh, various web servers, uh, the URLs and their specifications. It identifies information about how you want to visualize and sequence and various uh, bits of data coming from those web servers, and then how you want to symbolize uh, the data within the augmented reality display. So that's our, our web-based configuration environment. Uh, great. So there's another question from Sean. Uh, I have an existing field service application using the mobile device maps. How can I find that? How can I find out about? Uh, overlaying ArcView to this existing solution? Um, I think ArcView would be a parallel solution uh, that would access potentially the same data sets. Um, I don't think that currently we have the ability to embed um, our augmented reality capability into somebody else's uh, executable. 
Thank you. Uh, John Lockton, considering data quality and data completeness issue, uh, what would you say that augmented reality may make users too confident with regards to the data? And they think they may think the data is uh, geospill, so they are viewing it on a device. Um, no, the interesting thing there is that rather than having little black lines on bits of paper, we can represent in the augmented reality view, um, uh, we can symbolize the assets in a way that makes it very clear uh, what the um, spatial accuracy is likely to be. So we can actually symbolize the uh, assets um, in multiple different ways. We could display them using color to indicate their spatial accuracy. We could symbolize them in a fuzzy manner uh, using fuzziness or um, oversized dimensions to indicate um, the spatial accuracy. So there are many ways where we can symbolize in the AR display um, to indicate the expected accuracy of the data, uh, which is much, much better than a, uh, a map-based approach where we tend to just see nice little straight, narrow lines on bits of paper. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, there's two questions from Luis. The first one, have you done any work with EPRI, Electric Power and Research Institute in the US? They are also talking about an augmented reality app for electrical utilities. And there's a link for you if you want to have a look. Uh, that's great. Yes, we have. Um, in fact, they contacted us because they are interested in using OrgView as the example um, for that. Um, so we, are, we we've, they've asked us um, to provide our, our pricing and provide example and provide a, um, uh, uh, licenses for them to trial or to allow their customers or, or their users, their, sort of their uh, affiliates to trial. Oh, that's really good to know. And the second one is how do you deal with live data? For example, can you connect to sensors connected to the assets? And if so, how would you typically do this? Or does it simply come down to what data is available? Um, live data, you, you could definitely um, access live data. Now, at the moment, we don't have, oh, I, can't, I can't say we have a strict streaming mechanism for live data. We have a polling mechanism for live data, um, but uh, so we could actually be getting information from sensors, such as traffic. I mean, not that you'd want to necessarily do this, but you could do you know live density, uh, live uh, examples like traffic density, average traffic speed, uh, flow rates through pipes, temperatures within pipes, um, actual uh, current, you know, the current flowing through a cable. Um, uh, utilization of fiber. You know, you could, you can, you, you can, you can definitely symbolize. If you've got sensors that are actually feeding that information, then you can symbolize that, or use color or other techniques to symbolize that in real time. Yes. Great. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you everyone for joining another Guitar Ends at the webinar. Uh, once again, thank you, Mike. It was a really informative presentation, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you all. In another Gitai NZ webinar, have a uh, check regularly on Gitai NZ calendar of events. Thank you. Bye. And thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity.